right. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you here on our Thanksgiving Sunday. So glad you could be with us today. And I want you to turn to Psalm 145. Psalm 145, this is the uh, last of the five psalms at the very end of the book of Psalms, the beginning of the last five psalms, I should say. And when you open there, it's got at the top, Psalm 145, a praise of David. A praise of David. And so we're going to read these first three verses. We're actually going to walk through the whole psalm this morning, but we'll read before we get started the first three verses. And uh, a very important message here as we start our Thanksgiving week and end the Christmas season. And David praises God. He says, I will extol you, my God. Or in other words, exalt you. I will exalt you, my God, O King. And I will bless your name. The word bless is the name of our former president, believe it or not, in the Hebrew language is Barak, is bless. I will bless, which simply means praise. I mean, it's meaning I'm going to praise your name forever and ever. So what that means in a nutshell, I'm going to praise your name forever. I'm going to sing your praises, Lord, as long as I'm alive. <laughs> and of course, into eternity. But the idea of blessing him, um, it's not like we're like, I bless you, Father, and we're trying to give God a blessing. No, it means that we're like singing his praises to others. We're blessing him before others and giving him honor to other people. I'll praise your name forever and ever. Verse 3, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. All right, I'm going to start off this morning. I'm going to put a picture up here. And uh, no, that's not me in my senior picture, but it's close. <laughs> you can come and look at my yearbook if you'd like to after church, but that's pretty close. But anyway, that's Louis XIV, and he reigned a long time over France, 1643 to 1715. Add that up, everyone. That's a long reign. Well, anyway, in 1717... Louis XIV died. He preferred not to be called Louis XIV. He preferred to be called Louis the Great. Louis the Great. He was the monarch who declared at one time, I am the state. I am the state. In other words, I'm the government. You know, If somebody was complaining about the government, he was saying, I'm the government. <laughs> don't ever forget that, you know, like with don't complain because I'll, I'll let you have it. So he, com he declared that he was the state. His court was the most magnificent in Europe. Take a look here at a couple of pictures. These are modern pictures of his palace and his, his dwelling place for many, many decades there. And it's just gorgeous. This doesn't do honor to what it really looks like. It's, it's an amazing, amazing place, the mo most magnificent in Europe. And when he died, his funeral was spectacular. Now, in the church where the ceremony was performed, at the front of the church, there was a golden casket. And what Louis the Great wanted done is he wanted to have that casket up there in the front gleaming in gold. He wanted the lights to be dimmed in the room, and he wanted a single candle set uh, at there at the front of the, of the church. And I think I've got a picture of that candle. Yeah, there's a big lit candle sitting on top of his coffin. Okay, so picture that. You have all these people sitting in dead silence, they're waiting for the pastor to get up to speak. And there's this one candle sitting on Louis the 14th, 14th or Louis the Great, we should say. That's what he wanted to be called. Well, there's thousands of people in attendance. And what happened, the pastor started the message in this deadly quiet room by walking down off of the platform down to where the casket was, going up to the casket and snuffing out the candle and saying before the entire crowd, 
Only God is great. Only God is great. And you know what? What a funeral message that must have been after that. I'm sure that a thousand jaws went. <laughs> and I, I'm sure that he spoke a great message after that. It started off that way. Now, if we go back to Psalm 145, this praise of David. It's the only psalm in our Bible that begins with that title, a praise of David. Not to say that David wasn't praising God in other psalms and telling us how wonderful and how awesome our God is. But this is the one that happens to be titled, the only one that happens to be titled this way. This psalm, there aren't any prayer requests in this psalm. You know, a lot of psalms have a lot of prayer requests. There's no prayer requests. There's no confession of sin. There's no laments being made. This psalm, 21 verses, is pure praise concerning God. It's pure praise concerning God. He's reminding us of something that we often take for granted. Something that we often take for granted, which is how great our God really is. He's truly great. In fact, we have that song that we sing here from time to time, there is none like you. Man, I can tell you what, I, could, I looked up verses this week and all through the Old Testament, over and over, there's none like you. You are the one true God. Over and over, you have these verses popping out everywhere. I don't have time to share them all with you, but take my word for it. They are there. No one is like our God. And so David is saying the same thing. He's reminding this of this. And by the way, why is this important to you and I? It's because this. Our praises for God before others, when we're singing God's praises to other people, in other words, we could call it witnessing, when we're telling others about how great our Lord is, our praises, our witness is not what it, going, what it should be. It's not going to be what it should be unless we understand the true greatness of the God we serve. When you really get to know what he is like, it's not difficult to share him with others. It's not difficult. Okay, so in Psalm 145, David tells us what he saw in God that caused him to overflow. We're going to get to that in a second. This idea of just overflowing with uh, so much praise, so much that he called God's people. And listen to me carefully here. This is, I'm not going to be just talking about praising God today because I'm going to, I'm going to connect it with the idea of children and grandchildren. Children and grandchildren. He is praising God so much that he ties it in and says, listen everyone, listen all of God's people. You need to be declaring God to the next generation. You need to be sure to do that. Your children, your grandchildren, the generations to come, it needs to be passed down. What if the people that went through the Exodus saw the Red Sea open? And instead of walking across in mud up to their knees, they're walking across on dry ground. What if they saw that and they didn't tell their children at all? What if they saw God save the firstborn by putting the blood on the doors before they ever got to the Red Sea? What if they saw that and God, what if they never told the next generation? Well, it would, the truths about God would just basically go away. So th this morning... Before our Thanksgiving dinner, before Thanksgiving week, that's what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you not just about us knowing God, what he's like, and singing his praises to the people around us. We've got to do that. But listen, most importantly, our children and our grandchildren. And that's why I've titled the sermon today, Things We Must Tell the Children. Things We Must Tell the Children. Our ancestors are, I shouldn't say ancestors, our uh, prodigy, progeny are trusting in us. They're trusting in us to share this message with them. Let's bow our heads for prayer and then we'll get right into this. Father, we pray today that you'll use your word mightily in each of our lives. Lord, this is such a vital, vital truth. And of course, Father, we recognize 
that we need to be sharing the good news with others as you give us opportunity. But Lord, often we don't realize how important it is with our own children and grandchildren, and sometimes even great-grandchildren. And so, Father, we ask for you to use this word in every heart, every life, Lord. Let it just uh, transform us, Lord. Let it bring a, a form of revival, Lord, in our hearts and lives. And we pray this in your precious name, Lord Jesus, and for your sake. Amen. Many years ago, we were blessed to hear the evangelist Leonard Ravenhill. I mean, this is back in the 80s. Many people here today were in that service when Leonard Ravenhill drove all the way over from East Texas to Dallas. And, um, and I believe Gerald Wright went and picked him up and brought him here. And he, he was the great, great, great revivalist. I mean, all of his books revolve around revival. And he had to be, had to be 80, 85 years old when he was there, maybe pushing 90, I don't know. But he was definitely old, but he, he spoke. I want to say, he spoke for sure an hour. He might have spoken for an hour and a half, maybe two hours. It was long, but he held everybody spellbound. Well, one time he told this story about a uh, group of people that were taking a countryside tour, a countryside tour. By the way, off, uh, I'm going backwards here. If you, if you ever get a book by Lennon, Leonard Ravenhill, you won't regret it. He's, he's really awesome. But anyway, he was telling the story about these people on this countryside tour, just the most beautiful countryside. And they were visiting this picturesque village, and, and they, there was an elderly man standing next to this fence there. And uh, one of the ladies in the group, in a very condescending and very belittling way, asked this question to that elderly man, there by the fence, and she said this. She said, were any great men born in this village? Okay, you get the emphasis there on great men. Were any great men born in this village? You know, she was really condescending. But I love the, the elderly man's response, and this is what he said to her in reply. He said, whoop, he said, nope, only babies. Leonard Ravenhill. Nope, only babies. You know, the prolific theologian Warren Wearsby once wrote this. He once wrote that uh, human beings like Louis the Great, human beings are really good at wanting to call themselves great. That almost goes without saying. So many of them putting that moniker after their name or, you know, somehow implying about how great they are. And a few, few months ago, I told you about the people getting pulled over that, you know, are like uh, in government and different positions of authority. And maybe they might be driving under the influence and they say, do you know who I am? Like, you know, there's, you know. So people like to put the name great. But Wearsby said, you know what? You go to the Old Testament, you don't see anywhere in the Old Testament God calling human beings great anything except this. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great. God never calls humans great. He says, no, their wickedness is great, but humans not so much. <laughs> so in the passage that we read earlier, David wasn't focused on humanity at all. He wasn't focused on humans. He was overwhelmed by the greatness of God. And of course, verse 3, we read it. Let me go back one. Oh, I guess it got left out. Let's see. Yeah. Um, huh. Okay, I thought I threw a slide in there, but let me go back. You know the verse. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Three times. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. His greatness is unsearchable. And so, and you know, basically, let me, let me uh, define that when he says his greatness is unsearchable. Basically, the idea there is that his, um, his power and greatness is beyond our ability to understand it completely. Just about the time you think that you understand God, you come and you learn something new and you say, wow, I didn't know him as much as I thought I did. And you know what, that we spend our whole lives that way. Wow. 
Okay, so what I want to do is to keep it very simple and concise this morning. I'm going to share four things that we all must be passing on to the next generation. Four things we must, must, must tell our children and grandchildren. Let's start with his greatness, obviously. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And again, I've tried to help everyone see that most of the time when you think of people praising God, you think of something like this, okay, and they're lifting up hands and praising. That's probably what the Bible means by worship, okay? But praise, not so much. If, I, if, I, if somebody walks in the front door of my house and says this would be an odd thing for them to request, but they say, hey, Bob, sing your wife's praises. And I went, <laughs> the guy would be like, uh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted to hear good things, things that you love about your wife and why she's so awesome. Like yesterday, spending the whole day putting up Christmas trees and doing things and not sitting down, you know, old Bob, he, he's, he helps out there. Here, can I put an ornament on? Okay, good. Hang on, I'm going to go sit down for a while. Okay, I'm a little tired. But man, she's sitting there working away, and when he gets done, it's a masterpiece. Okay, so that's, okay, so get that in your mind. Worshiping, I fell down and worshiped him. I fell on my face. Yeah, they're falling down and they're, they're worshiping. But praise is really mean when you praise, you're singing that person's praises. Psalm 145 is David singing God's praises. His greatness. Look at this verse. One generation, verse 4. One generation shall praise your works. What's that? What he's created. Look at how great our God is. Look at the humpback whales. Look at the mountains. Look at the sun and the stars. Look at the sky. Look at the clouds. Look at the beautiful trees. Look at the hundreds of feet tall sequoias and uh, trees throughout California and Oregon and all along the West Coast. Amazing. Amazing. One generation, that's you and I, shall praise what you've created to another. One, and, sh and shall declare your mighty acts. What are his mighty acts? What is that? That is his miracles. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay. We are praising his miracles. The Red Sea opening. The giving of the law on Mount Sinai. The opening of the earth to swallow up the rebels. All these things through the Bible. The resurrection of Jesus. See, you're declaring his his works, the things that he created, amazing, wonderful to those children, and you're declaring his acts, the miracles, and you could even share things he's done for you over and over and over, things that sometimes were beyond, uh, beyond what's human, beyond if they're supernatural. All right? I will meditate, David says, on the glorious splendor of your majesty. Again, majesty being like his greatness, his uh, overwhelming presence. And on your wonderful works, men, verse 6, men shall speak of the might, the power of your awesome acts, the opening of the Red Sea, and I will declare your greatness. So he's kind of switching back and forth there. People will do this, and I will do this. People will do this, and I will do this. But number one, we need to be passing on to the next generation. We need to be singing the praises of God. Number one, his greatness, how amazing God is. The wor our world, listen, the world around us has become so dysfunctional because that has not happened. It has not happened. Uh, it's so dysfunctional. It's so full of hatred. Moms and dads have failed to teach, and not only to teach, but to model God's greatness, his character, his power, his strength. Um, and so dads and moms, I can't tell you how important it is for you to teach your kids and your grandchildren what God is truly like. Let me give you a little testimony. When Nicole and Lauren were little, uh, Kelly and I did 
all that we could to teach them about God. And not only that, to be a living example to them. I remember so clearly, you know, I had this this Bible story book. And it was really great because it was like day-to-day stories connected with Scripture. And then at the end, it had questions you could ask your kids. And I remember going through that book and interacting, sitting on the couch with Lauren on one side and Nicole on the other, and reading those and asking them those questions and interacting with them about God and about the ways of God. And then when we were done, we would pray together. And so often we would, you know, we would uh, close at night uh, the day by, by praying. They are tucked in their beds and, you know, uh, Marilyn, I got out my little, uh, what was it, that little puppet's name? It was named after your granddaughter, uh, Tiffany. And so Tiffany... Uh, her granddaughter Tiffany made this little puppet. It was just a cone, and it had a stick, and you could pop the head out, and the head would come out, and it, or you can't because it's upside down. So the head would come out, and you could spin it, and I would start talking to Lauren and Nicole like I was that little puppet, and I would spin it, and man, they, I mesmerized them with that thing, and I would tell them about God and talk to them, and hi, I'm Tiffany, and you know, I'd start talking and sharing with them. But man, we did everything we could think of. We would buy, Kelly and I, we would buy uh, video series, like by Focus on the Family. You know, we were quite against letting them just go into a room and turn a television on. I'll never forget one time I visited a family about 20, 25 years ago out near First Street in Garland and came to visit the family. A single mom had several children and said, hey, where's so-and-so? I was asking about their son because I saw... A couple of their children, I said, hey, where's so-and-so? Oh, he's in the back. And I went in the back, and his door to his room was shut, his bedroom. And so I knocked on the door and opened it, and there he was on the floor. And I said, hey! And he was on the floor with his, his face and his chin six inches from a television, a little television set. And I said, hey! He didn't even turn around. <laughs> he didn't even turn around. And I'm like, hey, yep. Yeah. And, and I went up to him, you know, and I'm like tapping him, and Finally, like looking at me, like, what are you doing in here? And you know, I was like, number one, I was shocked that this mother let him have a television in his own bedroom. And then the door shut. You know, who knows what he would have been watching? You know, you know, and it would have been, it could have been awful. And from what I remember, it wasn't great what he was watching. But nonetheless, we were really strict on them about what shows that they could watch. And you know, most of the time, we were putting in. VHS tapes and having them watch stuff we bought from Focus on the Family. And then we got, Kelly, remember the Nest series on the Bible? We got 12 videotapes on the 12 greatest people of the Old Testament, the 12 greatest people of the New Testament. We got the 12 greatest uh, Americans from the beginning of America. And you know, Harriet Tubman, and you go down the list, they had all these great Americans. There's right there 36 hours to to, to put into their brains. And so, you know, we just poured into them. When they'd come when they were teenagers, hey, Dad, we want to go see this movie with such and such, so and so. Who? What movie? This movie. Okay, hang on a second. I had this program. It would tell me how much of this, how much of that, how much of this, you know, sex, violence, language. I'd look at that. Oh, sorry, you're going to have to take a rain check. Oh, Dad. No, nope, sorry. Can't do it, you know. Why? Because, you know what, that was going to come one day. Those kind of things that are almost impossible, but you know what, as long as I was in control, I was going to be telling them no a lot more than I'd be telling them yes. You know, because I was trying to do all I could to protect them. And, of course, you know, they went off to college, and, uh, you know, they came back, and they were just like, Dad. You know, places like the devil's lair, yeah, and I'm like, yep. And that's why I was trying to protect you all these years so that you would know what's, you would, you would know what's right so when you saw what was wrong, you would really understand how bad it was. And, you know, in Nicole in her freshman year in college and Lauren in her sophomore year, they became dorm supervisors. They were supervising an entire dorm floor. They were supervising an entire dorm floor. And, by the way, saving me $10,000 each a year, glory to God. 
Well, I like that. But all that to say, everybody, you know what? I'm saying we got to pass it on to the children. Okay? Kelly and I are nowhere near being perfect and being perfect parents. Nowhere close. But you know what? We realized we needed to pass on God to the next generation, all right? Good books, good videos, screening which TV shows they could watch, screening which movies they could eventually go to. All the way till the day we pass them the baton, okay? You're 18, you're going off on your own, now you're making the decisions, okay? And of course they were making them all along, but they were doing them under our auspices, okay? So we were careful about what their brains ingested. Children become what they See and what they're taught. Your example and what you say with your lips. Okay? And unfortunately, kids with lousy examples for parents, they often grow up to become lousy parents. Not always, but often. Okay? So dad and moms, tell your kids about God's great greatness. Be sure to be an example of that to them. All right, what's number two? Okay, I said there's four here. We need to sing God's praises of his Greatness, we need to sing God, praise God's praises concerning his goodness. Okay, this is verses 7 through 10. So let's look at those. Verse 7, they shall utter. Okay, you passed the word down to the children. Okay, they shall utter the memory of your great goodness. Not only the children, but you. So you're telling them his greatness, but notice, you shall utter, gush forth, overflow. That's the Hebrew word there, gushing forth. It's like a fountain. Wow. It's just not like, hey, you know, pastor told me to do this once every 30 days with you. <laughs> no, it should be like continual, like a fountain. They shall gush forth. Okay, these are the people, as well as eventually the children telling their children, gushing forth the memory of your great goodness. And they'll sing of your righteousness. So we're supposed to be talking about his great goodness and God's righteousness. How righteous he is, how holy he is, how just the things that he does that are right and good. Look at verse 8. The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, great in mercy. See, they need to know that. They need to get that. They need to understand that. Verse 9. The Lord is good to all. Listen, the Lord's not just good to church-going folk. The Lord is good to everybody. The Lord is good to the unthankful and the evil, the Bible says. Jesus said that God causes his reign to fall on the righteous and on the unrighteous, on the just and on the unjust. He's kind to the unthankful and the evil. Verse 9, the Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Look at everything he created. Remember we said his works are what he created? His tender mercies are seen in everything. You hear birds ch chirping. This morning, Kelly and I looked out the um, kitchen window, and we have a bird bath right outside the window, and there was a squirrel sitting on the end of the bird bath. And it was reaching down in there and just taking a drink of water out of the bird bath. And I just sat there and watched that, you know, and just watched it sip. It didn't, it didn't drink like me, making noise, slurping it up. That thing was just like, you couldn't even tell that he was drinking, but he was. It was hardly making any waves. But his tender mercies, he takes care of squirrels and birds. And Jesus said, hey, listen. If God cares for them, how much more will he care for you, O oh, you of little faith? Teach them about that. Teach them. Uh, all your works, verse 10, shall praise you, O oh Lord, and your saints shall bless you. So all creation, all those creatures. You know, when you get up, I just, when I get up and hear birds chirping and singing, I'm just sitting there, man, Lord, they're praising you. And I need, to be, I need to do better than the birds that are singing your praises all day long that you made. Now, you don't understand what you're, they're saying, but who knows what God's hearing? Wouldn't that be awesome to know? All right, maybe he's just hearing. <laughs> I don't know. I'm thinking maybe there's something deeper. I don't know. But anyway, 
All right, so all your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. You know, in the story of the prodigal son, oh, and by the way, before I get to the prodigal son, you remember one time the Lord said, um, he said, don't, don't be good just to people who love you. Don't do that, because if you only bless those and, and uh, help those that love you, what big deal is that? Even, even corrupt humans do that. Even pagans do that. But love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who do. Man, because Jesus said, then your reward will be great in heaven. So, wow, you know, like we all have a lot, 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 long way to go here. We need to be thinking about what Jesus, he said, even evil people take care of people that love them. But be like God, care for people that nobody else cares for. The prodigal son. Why did he, when he was off in the far country, why did he take off and start heading back to see his father? Because his father was so good. His father was so generous. He says, I'm in here, the pig, I'm in the pigsty with these pigs, and my father's slaves back home have more to eat than I do. They're getting better food. I'm eating the pig slop. And so he took off toward his father. And so we need to tell our children not only about the greatness of God, we need to tell them about the goodness of God, how he cares for and he helps those even the unthankful and the evil. Okay, that's number one, his greatness. Tell them about his greatness. Number two, about his goodness. How about this one? His government. I would have probably said here his kingdom, but it's, I wanted to have all G's there, so you know, I just went ahead and followed what Warren Wearsby put with the three, with using G's, because <laughs> this is his outline. I'm just putting my own meat on his bones because I said I can't improve on those four G's. I love alliteration. You know, if you have, uh, let's see, uh, Nathan has a, uh, a David Jeremiah study Bible. Man, he is the king of alliteration. A, 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 B, 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 B. You know, his sermons are all the same letter. I'm like, how does he do that? How does he come up with them? It's amazing. He's got to have a thesaurus this thick trying to find ones that work. But anyway... Sing the praises to your children about God's government, about his kingdom, about his kingdom right now that exists, that wonderful kingdom that anyone who believes in Jesus is transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the uh, son of his love. Sing his praises to others about that kingdom. But you know what? Tell your kids about the eternal kingdom of God. Say, kids, God's returning. This isn't all there is. We need to be good citizens. We need to vote. We need to try to do all we can to bring flourishing to the world around us, to put people in office that will bring flourishing, that will bring justice, that will bring goodness to the world around. Yeah, try to get the best people you can, but not only that, don't forget that God's sovereign. He's in control, and we want his kingdom to come. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. We need to be praying that every day. You know what? We need earthly government to go away, and we need to have Jesus sitting on the throne. So you should be praying for that. Verse 11. <clears throat> they shall speak. Here, here's another thing we need to be telling the children. This, tell the next generation. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom. Talk of your power to make known to the sons of men, make known to your children and grandchildren his mighty acts, his miracles, and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Now David turns to God. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. God always has been, and he always will be in control of everything. Now, I know that sometimes it looks like, wow, it doesn't look like he's in control of everything, but he is. Now, don't forget this. God allows humans to have free will. So when people say, I'm going to tear down a, a, a downtown area, I'm going to set it on fire, I'm going to flip police cars over, you say, God in control? Yeah, he's in control. Because he, even though people get away with crime and doing things. God says, well, they may get away on earth, but they don't get away before me because God says whatever a human sows, that will he also reap. 
So when you see people walking out, you know, Target, you know, there's 8 million people and they're all walking out, stuff in their cars and their trunks with stuff, you know what? That's going to come back to bite them. You know, God, God knows everyone, every one of them, their names. He knows where they live and he knows the punishment he's going to bring upon them. You know what I think about, everybody, this is off the subject a little bit, but I think about how the world just doesn't get it. The Bible says about Satan, Satan comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Yet the world looks at what's going on in cities around the country, or that has gone on and probably will go on in the future, and the world looks at it and just says, oh, they're just, they're just sad. They're just, they're just letting out angst, inner angst. No? The Bible says Satan comes to steal. And people that do that are satanic. People that destroy. People that ruin. You know, what's crazy is that you had people ruining their very own neighbors lifelong. I mean, the people that they would stand up for, and ordinarily they're destroying their own neighbors and they're making life horrible for themselves. It's just, but you know what? Our world doesn't understand it because they don't understand God. They don't understand. You know, every time you hear about a person being murdered, the person that did that was satanic. It's of the devil. The devil sinned from the beginning. He was a murderer from the beginning. And they're just acting out satanically. That's why John, the God, Apostle John said in 1 John, sin is of the devil. Sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. So, you know, even, even when we sin, even when we get angry, whatever, whenever we say things we shouldn't say, we're, we're satanic. We're doing the devil's work. So anyway, David here is saying to God's people, tell your children and grandchildren about the greatness of the kingdom. Tell them how to lay up treasures in heaven. Teach them that. Say, listen, if you live for God and you do things for God with your life, everything you do, God is in heaven adding it to your account, and he's going to reward you for that. Everything you do for others, every prayer you lift, every dollar you give in generosity, in blessing. You know what? Our church, we don't spend everything that comes in on ourselves. We have an account, and we have money to give to people that are hurting. We can help people. Why? Because the Bible tells us to be zealous for the poor. And we should help people struggling. We have to take care of our missionaries. They have needs. They're in third world countries like Ed Coffey. I just got another letter from him the other day. We need to be able to bless them regularly. Send them, oh, this has happened. You remember you've heard so many terrible things happen in Liberia. People go in at night and just destroy but it's taken them years to build and steal and clean them out. It's horrible. You know, one day Jesus is going to return to earth and he's going to rule personally over this entire earth. So dads and moms, you have to help your children to understand that they only have a few years on this earth to lay up treasure in heaven. Okay? You need to, they need to know that. Okay? Young people, listen to me. You turn 18 and you say, well, you know what, I've gone to church all these years and I've done what my parents have told me, but you know what, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to do what I want to do. And so you do that for 20, 30 years, let's say, and then maybe when you're 40 or 50, you come back and you say, okay, you know what, I think I'll start living for God now. You know what you just did? You just wasted 20 or 30 years that you could have been laying up prizes rewards, riches in heaven for all the things you did to help others and bless others and, and support the church and support God's kingdom work, and you lost that. It's like wood, hay, and stubble to God. And you lost an opportunity to lay up treasure. Tell them what the kingdom will be like about rewards Tell them that they have a heavenly bank account. Tell them that they'll hear well done if they serve and honor God with their lives. You know, hey, listen, if, if you die as a child of God and you don't hear God say well done, good and faithful servant, nothing else matters. 
You'll be with him forever. But that will be just such a sad, sad day when you look in Jesus in the eye and you're hanging your head and saying, man, Lord, I could have lived for you, but I spent my life living for myself and doing what I wanted to do. And I was your child. That will happen. That will happen. Okay, so number one, what are we, be, what are we to sing God's praises, not only to people around us, but to our children, especially to our children and grandchildren. His greatness, his goodness, his government, number four, is his grace. And how could we not end on this? Oh, my goodness. I've got so many words underlined here in verses 14 through 21 that relate to God's grace and how kind and gracious and amazing he is. It'll just blow your doors off. Look at this. Talk about singing God's praises. The Lord upholds all who fall. Okay, you stumble spiritually and you get out of God's will, you know what? He's there to lift you up. He raises up all who are bowed down. Maybe you're bowed down with a huge burden. and You're carrying that. Jesus says, don't do that. Uh, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I am meek and lowly in heart. I'll give you rest. Let me carry that burden. Let me carry it. Don't you carry it. He raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Think about that. Every living thing. God blesses. God helps. Verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. The Lord is near. Is there anything better than that? The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them or deliver them. The Lord preserves all all who love him, but, and look, notice this, after singing God's praises and singing how he blesses human beings, David ends this section by saying, but the wicked he will destroy. You say, Pastor Bob, even like saved people? Yeah, okay, it does not make any difference. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. It's right in the Bible. Sin, when it's conceived, it brings forth, or lust, when it's conceived, brings forth sin. Sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. And it's like playing, like I've told you a million times, playing blackjack. Hit me. Hit me. Hit me. Yeah. Game over. If a person keeps saying to the devil, hit me, hit me, hit me, and they sin, and they sin, and they sin, and they sin, you know what happens? The game's over eventually. You lose. Now, sometimes you just lose by losing your health or losing your wealth or something, but sometimes you lose your life. And by the way, it's true. Look, Jesus said, I was listening to it this morning or yesterday. I'm trying to remember. Was it yesterday or this morning? Maybe yesterday. Luke chapter 13. I'm in Luke. And Jesus said, those 18 people, in Jerusalem that the Tower of Siloam fell on. Do you think they were any worse sinners than those that were around him? And he said, no, and I tell you, unless you repent, you'll all die the same kind of death. Unless you repent, Israel, you'll die the same death that those people died that had the, the tower fall on him. What was Jesus saying? Jesus was telling Israel, you keep sinning. You keep rejecting me? You put me on the cross? Oh, yeah. You'll live 40 years longer than I will. You'll live into your old age, but one day you're going to have the same death experience those 18 people did. A, a horrible, brutal, violent death experience when Rome comes into Israel and destroys Israel in 66 through 70 A.D. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. So this is true of believers and unbelievers. It's true of pastors, and it's true of 
uh, people that are uh, car repairmen and are account accountants and nurses and doctors. It doesn't matter. Okay? Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That is set in stone. All right? The Lord preserves all who love him. He cares for them. He guards them. He protects them. But the wicked, he'll destroy. Okay? They keep sinning and keep sinning and keep sinning and keep sinning. You know, you ever get on the internet and look at the people holding up the little signs that have their name and the number on it? They have been arrested, and maybe they like, might, might be on uh, methamphetamines. They're really like 30 years old, but there's, in the picture they look like they're twice as old. <laughs> Sometimes more than that. <laughs> they're, they're in awful shape. Why? Because sin is death-dealing. So his grace. Moms and dads, teach your children and grandchildren about God's grace. First of all, in salvation. And second of all, God's grace in the matter of being gracious to those around them. And you know what? You can't just teach it. You've got to model it. They've got to watch you for 18 years and watch you and watch you and see how you treat others and how you speak to others. And when things don't go your way, you know, like if you're at the, the drive through and they mess up your order or something, are you going to cut them some slack or say, what are you doing back there? What's the matter with you all back there? Come on. Get with the program. You're not only slow, you can't get the order right, you know, and you're letting them have it. Well, they, you know, they, they learn more from what they see often than what they're taught because you're teaching them with your example. They're watching you continually. If, if, for instance, if you fail your spouse, let's say you just get angry and you fail your spouse. If you don't, if you don't know how to say I'm sorry to your spouse, how are they going to learn to say that to their spouse? You know, if you just, if you just uh, blow your top and you never go back, if your kids never see you say, hey, um, you know what, I, I was so wrong. Would you forgive me? They need to see stuff like that. See what humility is. All right, so you get down to the last verse. Here we are. We're at the close. One story and we're done. David gets to verse 21, and he ends the psalm by, like he began. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. You say, Pastor Bob, what verse comes to your mind for New Testament believers? That's all Old Testament, and it's for our prophet. I love this verse. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. That, that, you are these things so that you may proclaim the praises, the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Okay, one story and we are done. On January 12th, 2010, a massive and devastating earthquake stuck, struck just outside the capital city of Haiti uh, called Port-au-Prince, Port-au-Prince. Countless buildings in the city collapsed. Over uh, 100,000 people lost their lives. And of course, you realize in Haiti, the building codes aren't what they should be. And so people are living in homes that just two, three stories that just fell in on them. 100,000 people died. The already shaky electrical grid was destroyed along with every other form of infrastructure. Everything was devastated. No electricity. They didn't have it for months. The night after the initial Earthquake, aftershocks kept coming. People were not going into their homes. There's no way. Everyone in that entire country went out and tried to find a park, an open area, a soccer field where they could sit and sleep. No electricity. If there was light, they were either flashlights or candles. But you know what? They 
already were hurting for uh, like technology, like the stuff that we take for granted over there, it was a lot different. They had it, but not like we have it, okay? NPR said this on their report, for the Western hem Hemisphere's poorest country, the earthquake that hit Haiti in January of 2010 was an especially cruel blow. Despite this, it's hard to find a Haitian who doesn't profess a belief in a loving God. So what did the Haitians do when there was no electricity, when they were in those soccer fields and when they were in those parks, crammed, stuffed full of families and crying babies and hungry families and hungry people? What did they do? I'll tell you what they did. They sang. They sang. Songs just burst out in the middle of the night and people began to sing God's praises. When you don't have electricity, one thing you still have is a song. When you've lost everything, you and I still have a song we can sing. Over the hills of Haiti, those first terrible nights under the starlit sky, the voices of the people of Haiti rose up in grief and prayer and hope. They had something that really, that we've kind of lost in America, everybody. They still had it. And anyone who visits a Haitian church or a family understands that when they hear them sing. They still have the songs of praise to God for his greatness, his goodness, and his grace in spite of the tragedies they've endured. So what do we do with this? We remember we always should be singing God's praises. We might proclaim, 1 Peter 2.9, proclaim the excellencies of him who called you and I out of darkness into his marvelous light. Always be singing his praises whenever you get the opportunity to the people around you. But even more than that, moms and dads, please, please, please sing his praises to your children and your grandchildren. Teach them his greatness, teach them his goodness, teach them his government, teach them his grace. Do that for nonstop for 18 years and you'll be so glad that you did. It doesn't mean that it, it's, you're not promised that they are going to stay close to God. But you know what? You'll be able to say in your heart, you know what? I did my best and I'm going to continue to pray for them no matter how they choose to live. Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, thank you so much for your people, Lord. Thank you so much for your word that they come to drink in week after week like, like water to a thirsty soul, Lord. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for the things that it teaches us, Lord. God, how I praise you, Father, for the wonderful things it reminds us of. Now, Father, what every one of us need here today is to say to you, Father, I need your help to be a better person, a better witness for you to others and to my own family. Lord, I'm not what I should be. Lord, help me to be more focused. Help me to be more on fire. Help me to be more authentic and real to my family, to my coworkers, to my God. Father, we need your grace. We need the power of your spirit. Give us your resurrection power, Lord. And we pray these things in the wonderful, mighty, matchless name of Jesus. And all of his people said, amen. All right, thank you, everyone. And at this time, we're going to have our dinner, our yearly Thanksgiving dinner. I'm so excited about this. And I'm not sure, uh, does anybody know if we have a protocol? Are we going to have the, the uh, uh, senior saints go first? We normally do, do we not? Okay. All right. So why don't we do that? Why don't we go ahead and dismiss? If you are, let's say, 60 or over, go ahead at this time and head toward the fellowship hall.
And then once you let them get out the door, 60 and older, okay, their stomachs start squawking before ours do. Okay, that's, you know, they, they need. So let them get out there first. And then as soon as they get through the doors, then the rest of you can be dismissed. Thank you so much. And we want to thank everybody that joined us online. Sorry that you can't be here for the dinner, but we hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you, everyone. God bless.